Welcome everyone to the Sparks Heritage Museum's digital lecture series. My name is Christine Johnson. I'm really glad to have you here today. Um, today's lecture is on the history of transit in Northern Nevada. And I'm really excited about this one. Um, both because of who the presenter is and also because originally when I planned this, uh, this was meant on our national list of, of special days, this was meant to be National Train Day. And I was really excited and contacted Mr. Adam Michalski, who is our guest presenter today, giving this wonderful lecture. And I said, guess what? It's National Train Day, couldn't be a better day. And sadly, I've come to find out that it has been a canceled day, but that's okay. We're gonna still celebrate trains. Our Sparks Heritage Museum is focused in part on the history of the city, which is rooted in railroad history. And of course, our presenter today is Adam, as I mentioned, who is the education curator at the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City. Again, totally focused on railroad history. And for those of you who are here today with us, you must be railroad fans. And so I'm excited to then to introduce Adam, who is again the curator of education and spending his time here with us this Saturday to share his lecture, The History of Transit in Northern Nevada. Adam has a master's degree in history and his focus in history was on transportation. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Adam. Thank you very much, Christine, for having me here today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Carol Coleman and uh, Stephanie Fry for um, having me here today as well, and the Sparks Heritage Museum for uh, allowing me to present uh, today. And, um, you know, like Christine said, it, this used to be National Train Day, but I mean, do you really need a, a special day to celebrate trains? I mean, come on, it, we all love trains, so we can celebrate it any day of the year. Um, at least we do here at the Railroad Museum down in Carson City. Today's topic that we're going to cover is um, history of transit in Northern Nevada. And, let's see. and so some of the topics we're going to cover are uh, streetcars in Reno Sparks, um, inner urbans in Northern Nevada, uh, BNT Transit, and Transit Today. Uh, what Reno looked like at the turn of the 20th century. You can see uh, we're in downtown Reno with the old depot. Uh, we got a Southern Pacific train that's probably just arriving. Um, so what was going on in Reno at that time? Well, Reno's population back in uh, 1900 was 4,500 people. And by 1910, the population had increased to 10,867. Um, mining was still a big industry in Nevada at that time. Um, the Tonopah and Goldfield mining booms were occurring. Rail connections were built to connect Reno to the mining business. Um, also, we had the, the Newlands project of 1905 that was helping to develop uh, the water resources from the Truckee and Carson River. And the, that water was being sent to the Lahontan Valley and Fernley for agricultural purposes. So this meant there was a lot of business growth in uh, Northern Nevada at that time. And all of that business was helping to shape Reno uh, into a, a hub for Northern Nevada. Shortly thereafter, we had the addition of Sparks. Sparks was formed in 1904 when the Southern Pacific uh, moved their division, uh, div division point from Wadsworth to Sparks. Um, and that occurred because the, the Southern Pacific realigned their route across Northern Nevada. And that, um, that meant that the, the line was shortened. And so that meant they could uh, space out the division points uh, a little bit differently. And so they, they moved the, the division point for, to, from Wadsworth to Sparks. And by 1910, Sparks population was 2,500 people. And so with all this development in the area, there was a, a, a need for better public transportation in the region. Public transportation in the area was, were, were streetcars. Um, this photo was taken at the corner of Sierra and Second Streets in downtown Reno, circa 1907. The first streetcars were invented by Frank Sprague in 1887. And um, shortly thereafter in 1888, uh, the first streetcar system was installed in Richmond, Virginia. And within, um, within uh, three years, over 200 streetcar lines were uh, either built or proposed in the United States. Um, so the streetcars were becoming very popular with city leaders 
Um, the streetcars were very nice and like, the electric streetcars were very nice because uh, before that you had a lot of animal pollution from the, the horses that, I mean, they were, you know, having their droppings all over the street. Uh, it was becoming a major problem for big cities that uh, these horses were, with their horse-drawn streetcars were making a mess everywhere. Um, that was a huge issue. Um, but what was really nice about the electric streetcar was it, it didn't have, well, for one thing, it didn't have that pollution. You could operate them uh, whenever you wanted. You didn't have to, I mean, with the horse, you had to feed it hay, water it. With this, you just flip a switch, you have electricity, boom, you're down the tracks. And so you can just, you can, uh, it made things a lot more convenient. Then by, by 1900, there were about 15,000 miles of streetcar lines um, in, in the United States. So it was a system that streetcars grew very rapidly in, during the 1890s. There are several early streetcar proposals in the Reno Sparks area. And um, so some of them, so we had um, a lot of the earlier proposals were either mule or horse powered uh, streetcars. And um, there were a few that were few proposals that included electric streetcars. I mean, a lot of these were meant to operate um, basically from downtown Reno out towards uh, Keystone, along Keystone, out toward Keystone Avenue in that area. Um, that's where a lot of the development was uh, going in at that time. Um, but none of those uh, streetcar proposals ever took off. Um, there was even one proposed uh, electric streetcar line that was supposed to go to the mines at Oling House, which is out towards Wadsworth. Um, that would have traversed the Truckee River Canyon. Um, however, that was never built. Um, and so that proposal never took off. Although I think it would be kind of interesting to see a, a trolley car or a, a streetcar in the Truckee River Canyon and heading towards Wadsworth. That would be really interesting to see. A transit company was started, and that was the Nevada Transit Company. And so you can see here we have a map and I'm, uh, the, the line. And so the line began on B Street, which was Harriman Avenue, which is now Victorian Way, and it ended at, well, it started at the, the, the Southern Pacific Roundhouse, which uh, was across the street from the Sparks Heritage Museum today. So that's where the, the, the trolley, the streetcar line started. And um, it made its way uh, along B Street and then up to Crater Way and 4th Avenue, um, made its way west past Coney Island. And then it, it made its way into downtown Reno and it ended at the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad Depot um, off of Sierra Street. And so uh, it was a total of 4.5 miles of trackage. Here's an example of a Nevada Transit Company car from the early 1900s. Um, as you can see, it kind of it, it kind of looks similar to a, a cable car that you would see in San Francisco. And that's because these cars were actually purchased from San Francisco. We, we're not sure if they were actually cable cars themselves that were converted into streetcars, but they're just based on the look of it, uh, it appears that it, it could be, that could be the case. Um, also, these cars were painted a bright yellow color and it could be uh, seen quite easily on uh, Sparks and Reno streets. So this is a, a photo from, uh, we believe it's, we believe this photo is from uh, the first day of operation in 1904. And the line officially opened on Thanksgiving Day, November 24, 1904. Nevada Transit uh, hauled 3,000 riders on the first day at 10 cents a ride. Um, the rides took approximately 15 to 20 minutes between Reno and Sparks. And so you can see, it looks like there was a lot of people out there that day. Um, and so you can see, it, it just looked like it was uh, quite a busy day for them and they had Looks like they were probably having a good time. Um, so we had some really cool, this is, sounds like it was a really fun day for everybody that was able to participate. The name was changed to Reno Traction Company uh, from Nevada Transit or from Nevada, Trans, Nevada Transit Company. And so here you can see um, they, the Reno Traction Company needed a place to store their cars, their street cars. And um, so there's a map, we have a map up here that shows where that location was. So this was on 4th Street 
and um, Morrill Street. And um, so you can see there was a car barn at this plate at this uh, at this intersection, and they had store they had enough room to store six uh, Reno Transit Company um, uh, streetcars. Um, this site today is actually um, the last time I checked, it was actually a, a restaurant supply company. Uh, so it, this the car barn itself, I don't it doesn't it does no longer exist today from when I've been over there to investigate, it doesn't look like it exists anymore. We have a map here of the, the Reno Transit System, or the Reno Traction Company in, uh, in Reno. And so we can, we're, we can kind of see some of these basic, these are, these are the lines that, uh, that they had at the time when the, at, its, at its peak. And so they're all, I have them all color coded here. And so the original route uh, the 1904 hour out is the is this green line here that followed Fourth Street and then made a turn onto uh, made a left turn onto Sierra and then um, made another left turn on Second Street and then ended up at the uh, at the SP Passenger Depot and then we had there was another extension um, this red line here as you can see that was built around 1906. And that line extended down Virginia Street to Liberty. And then there was another extension in 1907 from Liberty Street and right off of Virginia Street down California Avenue. And it ended at Plumas. And there, the, uh, the Reno Traction Company, uh, they had an interchange with the Nevada Interurban, uh, which went to the Moana Baths. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the, the program. But they had an extension, so that was the extension they built to connect with the Nevada Interurban. Um, in 1906, we had another extension along Second Street, or Second, yeah, Second Street, uh, that went all the way down to Keystone Avenue, and um, that was cut. There's an interesting story behind uh, the first run on the Keystone Avenue extension. Uh, the first run on the line was December 30th, 1906, and the at the end of the day, uh, during some of the last runs, um, there was a snowstorm. And so when the streetcar got to the end of the line at Keystone and Second, um, the car went off the tracks. <laughs> and the car, the, 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 the car got, the, the streetcar got stuck. And so in the morning, so they just left the car there uh, overnight. And then in the next morning, they had to retrieve it with a, another a uh, streetcar to help pull it out of the, uh, to help it pull out to, to get it back on the tracks. Um, and there were some other extensions too. So uh, in 1907, there was a line that was extended to uh, the UNR camp, well, the University of Nevada campus that ended at the, the Center Street gates. There was a, another extension in uh, 1909 and 1910 that uh, went over to the Wells neighborhood um, as you can see here. And also here in, in brown at the bottom here, there was an extension that headed towards uh, St. Mary's Hospital. And finally, there was a, a temporary line that was used to serve the fairgrounds. And so this yellow line up here, you can see this, the track would go to the fairgrounds and they would put that in during the summer months when the fairgrounds were, were in use. And then they would just take it out at the end of the year. Um, in total, uh, there were 7.5 miles of, of streetcar lines in Reno at one time. The Reno Traction Company streetcar schedule. Um, so we have the, on the Sparks line, uh, they had half hourly service between Reno and Sparks. And the cars would leave every half hour from 6.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then they would run every hour on the hour until uh, midnight. And they had uh, various, uh, uh, differences for service on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, you can also see the, the second street line is mentioned uh, with 15 minutes service from 6.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, we had and the fourth street line um, that operated on the same time and leaves from the same point as the second street car. Um, and you also had the lines to the University at Berks Edition, um, which operated at various times as well. And um, in total, uh, they they would operate about six they would operate about six cars at any one point throughout.
throughout the day. Um, so there'd be two, there would be two uh, cars on the Sparks line, and then there would be one each on all the other lines. Here's an example of uh, a streetcar heading south about to cross the SP tracks at Sierra Street, uh, arriving from Sparks. And so you can kind of get an idea of what the streetcar system looked like, uh, downtown Reno at that time, um, along this, this, in this area. Um, about 80% of the, the traction Reno Traction Company's business was on the Sparks line. And so this, this business was very popular for shoppers and commuters. Um, so you, you, you could, and I think it, you know, I think it would work both ways too, where you would have a lot of, you know, commuters coming from Sparks and uh, shoppers coming from Sparks to go to Reno. And I think you also had a lot of, um, a lot of commuters going from Reno to the SP shops uh, in Sparks. So I think it, it, it was a very busy line uh, for uh, in each direction. Example of one of the Reno Traction Company uh, cars at, uh, at the SP Roundhouse. You can see it's outside the SP Roundhouse at the end of the line. And it has a, a banner for Whelan's Park, which is eventually referred to as Coney Island. And so here you can see uh, an example of that. Um, and this was a this was a nice way for the streetcar company uh, to make business on the weekends. Wheelands Park, uh, Coney Island. So what was it? Well, it was a it was a park where uh, it was an amusement park about halfway between Reno and Sparks, and the streetcar fare was five cents to Wheelands Park uh, from Reno or Sparks, and uh, Coney Island visitors could go there and listen to live music go on rides, launch rowboats, uh, take in the boat races, and there was a tug of war at 4 p.m. each day. And families were encouraged um, to bring uh, their own picnic lunches. Amusement parks were a very big uh, selling point for streetcar companies. Um, a lot of, a lot of, throughout the country, a lot of um, streetcar companies and interurbans, they had their own, uh, uh, amusement parks. Um, this was a way for, because they had, at the time, they had surplus uh, power that they could use. And um, so they could use that to power rides at the parks. And also this gave the, uh, the traction companies the ability to, um, to have business on the weekends. So because during the week, you have, you know, Monday through Friday, you have a lot of shoppers and you have a lot of commuters, but on the weekend, you, you didn't have as much of that business, but if you had a, uh, an amusement park at one part of the line, well, then you could make some more money for the, for the railroad, for the transit company, so that they could offer rides to that park on those days. The decline of streetcars at Reno Sparks began around 1917, and annual revenues for the Reno Traction Company were approximately $10,000 and expenses were $18,000 at this time in 1917. In 1919, the Reno, uh, the Reno Traction Company petitioned the Public Commission of Nevada to abandon all lines except, for, except from Reno to Sparks. Um, despite protests from riders and, uh, and a, a case that was challenged in the Nevada Supreme Court, uh, the Public Service Commission granted permission to abandon the lines on January 15th, 1920. So after January 15th, 1920, all the lines were abandoned that we showed you in that previous map, um, except for the line between Reno and Sparks. You can see the cradle board in the window, which I thought was really interesting in this photo. And you get a really nice view of the, the conductor and the motorman. Um, the, the, this would be the conductor here with the, he's got the change uh, for the rides and then the motorman would be here uh, with the button, all the nice buttons on his jacket. Service continued to decline on the Sparks line uh, throughout the 1920s. And the Public Service Commission received numerous complaints about unclean cars and cold winds entering the cars uh, during the, the winter months. So in 1925, the terminus in Reno was cut back from the SP Depot to Sierra and 4th Street, which was based on a Reno City Council suggestion. Um, 
this just seemed kind of a an odd thing to do at the time um, because a lot of the traffic was going to and from the SP Depot at that time. Um, but the Reno Traction Company liked the suggestion uh, because that meant that they would uh, have fewer riders and they were hoping that they could eventually abandon the service altogether. On June 15th, 1927, buses started operating on the route between Sparks and Reno. And this sounded the death knell for Reno Traction. On September 2nd, 1927, the Public Service Commission uh, allowed the Reno Traction Company to abandon their last remaining line between Sparks and Reno. And then on September 6th, uh, that was the last day of operation for Reno Traction. Um, but there's one really interesting story that I liked um, on that last, on the last run from uh, Reno to Sparks. Uh, I think the, it sounded like they're having a really good time on that last run. Um, so during the final run into Sparks, at midnight on uh, September 6, 1927, the motorman tied down the whistle for the last few minutes of the run. And so he just had the whistle blowing constantly for like three or four minutes as they were making their way through Sparks. And uh, there were a lot of uh, unhappy residents along the route that were trying to sleep and um, they were very, un they were, un they were very, uh, they weren't happy with the decision, the motorman's decision to, to just keep blasting the horn like that, or the whistle. But the passengers certainly did approve of the motorman's, uh, uh, his decision to just blow the whistle constantly for four or five minutes. We have our motor cars running today. So if you hear whistles in the background, um, I just heard our McKean motor car whistle just go off. So um, if you hear any of that, uh, that's what we have going on. Uh, today. We have our motor cars out. And then I wanted to talk uh, briefly about inner urbans. Uh, so inner urbans were kind of like a hybrid between streetcars and passenger trains. Um, and then here we have an example of uh, a Pacific Electric inner urban. Um, this is what uh, 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 an inner, inner urban might look like. This is from taken, taken down in Southern California on the the Pacific Electric. They were famous for their red cars in Los Angeles. Um, they had a 1,000 mile system uh, throughout Southern California, which was um, one of the largest systems in the country. Um, and then that, that system was abandoned uh, around 1960. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was just a really large system. And, it, and I always kind of wonder what it'd be like if Pacific Electric still existed today. It would be kind of nice to get around uh, Southern California on one of these cars as opposed to having to drive everywhere and dealing with the headache of Los Angeles traffic. Inner urbans, like I just mentioned before, they're kind of like hybrids and street hybrids of streetcars and passenger trains. Um, they were bigger than streetcars, but smaller than steam trains. And inner urbans use electricity similar to streetcar lines. Also, um, what was nice about inner urbans was that they could uh, they could operate on city streets, uh, kind of like on, on streetcar lines, or on they could also be used on private rights of way in rural areas, um, which was very common in the Midwest. Um, inner urbans operated more like transit systems and could be used to connect nearby destinations, uh, nearby destinations that were several miles away with fast frequent service to a nearby city. Uh, so that's kind of what was going on in LA. You could have a, a train go from, say, like LA to Glendale or Pasadena, and um, so they could they could uh, connect to. That way, you could have a way to connect your suburbs to the downtown area. Because streetcars operated with cities within cities, and steam trains operated between major cities, inner urbans filled a gap in regional transportation that was impractical for streetcars. Um, or steam trains to provide. Um, America's first inner urban was the, the Newark and Granville Street Railway of Ohio. And that opened in December of 1889. By 1916, inner urban routes mileage, inter, inter urban mount route mileage peaked at 15,580 miles. And uh, most of those routes were within the Midwest. Um, 
So yeah, so then here we have the example of the Pacific Electric cars. Um, so yeah, but most of these systems went out of existence in by 1960. We'll look at some proposed uh, interurbans in Nevada. Um, so we have a few listed here, proposed routes. Uh, there was a route proposed to Steamboat Hot Springs. There was another proposal for the Riverside Railroad Company, which was supposed to go out to Mayberry Ranch. Um, there was also uh, proposed routes to Lake Tahoe. There was another one out in Fallon called the Fallon Electric. And also uh, there was one completed interurban in Nevada and that was called the Nevada Interurban. First, we'll take a look at the Steamboat Hot Springs and their plans for an interurban. Um, one of the first proposals for an interurban in Nevada was a line from Reno to Steamboat Hot Springs. Um, Captain J.W. Hopkins received a franchise to build an electric railway to Steamboat Springs in December of 1903. Uh, he planned to develop a hotel there, but that project stalled for several years. And then in August of 1907, uh, the property and franchise were sold to George Phoenix, who was a local developer. And Phoenix had grand plans to include a, sana to include a sanatorium at Steamboat as well. Um, but unfortunately, like all great plans, they went nowhere. When the, the Virginia and Truckee uh, caught wind of this, um, they decided that they didn't want the competition for the interurban. And also um, Phoenix had talked about building an electric railroad to the new mining districts at Jumbo. So once the, the VNT heard about this, they were very uh, unhappy about this. And so they, uh, made a proposal that uh, the, that the Virginia Truckee would arrange to install trolley wires from Reno to Carson. That was supposed to be a, a, a big advance um, that the, the Virginia Truckee was planning on electrifying their railroad um, to Carson City. And um, so once the Virginia and Truckee, uh, once they called for this in March of 1908, um, this announcement effectively ended all discussion of an interurban to, to Jumbo and Steamboat. So George Phoenix's development never, his interurban line, his hopes for that just went nowhere. The VNT never electrified its railroad. Um, and so that we're kind of left to wonder what that might have been like if they had electrified their railroad. Um, I'm sure a lot of people around here at the museum would be not too pleased about that. And then there was a proposal for the Riverside Railroad Company. And this was, uh, this venture was supposed to leave, it was uh, a line that was supposed to depart from uh, 2nd and Keystone Avenue. And it would, it would connect to the, uh, to the Reno Traction Company there. And it was gonna head across the Truckee River. Like this is, this area here that we're looking at is at Idlewild Park and it's by 2nd Street and, uh, and uh, Dickerson Road. And so this is the area where the bridge would have crossed um, to go, it would go through what is now present day Idlewild Park, and then it would head along the river to Mayberry Ranch, uh, which would be at the corner of McCarran and Mayberry today. With this route, um, they actually built, uh, in 1907, they actually built uh, bridge piers that were in place in the in a park were in this location, and uh, they also built 2,000 feet of track. Uh, however, the project never moved beyond that and eventually faded. And of course, there were, with Lake Tahoe being the destination that it was becoming at the time in the early 1900s uh, as a major tourist destination, uh, there were lots of um, ideas about how do we connect Lake Tahoe to Reno and Carson City and uh, the rest of the region. Um, in 1906 and 1907, there were several proposals for interurban lines uh, to Lake Tahoe. And again, um, George Phoenix, who we talked about earlier with the, uh, the Steamboat Hot Springs development, um, he had proposed to construct an interurban, but this time it would connect Reno to Glenbrook. And this proposed route would was this route was proposed to tunnel under Mount Rose and follow the lake shore to Glenbrook. Um, I don't really know much about, uh, you know, building railroads. 
Um, I mean, but it just seems like I, I would I would love to have seen what they would have done to to tunnel underneath Mount Rose. Um, I I, just, I would just love to have heard what like sit in that room and talk about those plans. It just it it just boggles my mind to think that you're going to tunnel through granite like that. And um, I mean, I'm not even sure how long that tunnel would have to be to even get to the, to Lake Tahoe. But I just find that so amusing that it's just I would I wish I was actually ever done just to see what it would have looked like. But um, but yeah, so it, that route uh, as we as we've come to know that another great uh, another great idea was squashed due to lack of funding and um, wasn't very practical. Um, there was also uh, at, the, at around the same time an, another group of investors from back east. Uh, they surveyed an, an, an interurban route to encircle Lake Tahoe. Um, that's another route that, as we know, never became um, never became a reality. Um, there was another line that was proposed from Reno to Brockway, which is near Crystal Bay. Um, and then also um, banker and rancher Thomas Rickey proposed a line from the state prison in Carson City uh, through downtown Carson City with a connection to Carson Hot Springs and um, a line to Brockway. Uh, un unfortunately, none of these lines were ever built, um, although it, I wish one of them would have because it would have just been really interesting to see the engineering feats that would have had to have been accomplished to do that. And then there was another railway that was out in Fallon, the Fallon Electric Railroad Company. And this was another route that um, was proposed in the region. Um, this one got a little bit farther along in the process of construction than some of the others in the region. Um, uh, Fallon leaders wanted a better transportation to get agro agricultural products to market. Um, Fallon did have a branch on the Southern Pacific but it was inadequate for transportation in the region. Um, and then also they wanted a connection to the mining district at Sand Springs, which were southeast of Fallon. Um, so in, in May 1913, Dr. C.A. Haskell proposed building the Fallon Electric Railroad Railway Company with two routes. One route would go east to a development at Stillwater. And then there was gonna be another route so this is the route that would, so here you can see on the map, uh, it would go out to Stillwater and a little bit beyond. And then there was this route that was heading Southeast and that was to go to the mining district at Sand Springs. Um, that, would, that route would be about 31 miles long to Sand Springs from Fallon. And then, um, and, and so the railroad, and also what was kind of interesting about this proposal was that they didn't, actually plan on operating electric streetcars like that we think of, but they were gonna use um, Edison storage battery cars. And these were some very early, this was a very early technology developed by um, Edison um, that would have been a, a battery operated car that could be recharged between runs. And uh, we, I know a lot of times we, we tend to think about um, battery technology is being relatively new um, in terms of like with Tesla and the, the battery operated cars that they have and um, just some of the, the, those types of things. But, um, but battery operated uh, streetcars were a consideration back in the early 1900s and into the teens. And even with automobiles back then too, there was even considerations of using battery powered uh, cars back then as well. Um, but they have the same problem that that still exists today, which is the, the energy storage. And so um, the, the Edison battery cars that were just, they were not feasible and they didn't work very well. Um, I think they're maybe a hundred or so years ahead of their time. Maybe they would work today a little bit better, but back then not so much. Um, and then also, um, because of a shortage of funds, much of the construction work was completed with volunteer labor from local farmers. And so these local farmers would come out and they, they graded the tracks. Um, they helped to build the, the uh, bridges and, uh, and the infrastructure for the railroad. 
Um, and then, so that way, when they, they had the volunteer labor, they could use the scarce funds they had to, to build major items such as bridges, rails, ties, et cetera. This is a view of Harrigan Road, which is in Fallon. Harrigan Road leads um, into uh, the east side of Fallon. And if, you, if you're on the east side of Fallon, you'll see Harrigan Road, but if you, so if you look south, Harrigan Road, that's where the, 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 the Fallon Electric Railway graded, um, graded their line, um, but it, does, it no longer exists today. But if, you, but if you look north of Highway 50 at Harrigan Road, you can, you can kind of make out, um, you can make out a bit of, like there's a, a Y there that um, looks like they graded it, but it was never completed. But I believe that was for the Fallon Electric Railroad Company. And it was meant to connect to the Southern Pacific branch, which used to end at that location. Now I believe it just ends about a couple blocks uh, to the west of there. Um, but you can see this is Harrigan Road. This is where they um, they had a seven miles of the route was supposed to follow Harrigan Road, heading south. This view is of um, this. This view is actually from Highway 50. And this is near the salt flats between Salt Wells and Sand Mountain on Highway 50 between mileposts 42 and 43. Um, so off in the distance, um, beyond the south, the beyond the salt flats, there's actually a roadbed out there for the Fallon Electric Railroad Company. And um, I've, you, if you look in Google Maps um, at, at that at that area, you can, you, and if you bring in like the the Google Earth. Um, image overlay, you can kind of make out where the that line was graded. World War I and a lack of funds and insufficient population at the time killed the railroad. Um, Churchill County at that time in the, in the 19 teens had about 2,800 people total. And um, so it just, it just really wasn't making sense to complete this railroad when um, not many people were actually going to be able to use it. So at this time, um, interurbans were falling out of, of use. Um, at this time, people were starting to use autos and buses more. Um, and so interurbans just weren't very popular at that time. And then the scheme died permanently in 1916 because Dr. Haskell, who was in charge of the project, um, he moved to Montana. And then once he left, there was nobody to take his place to continue the, the construction of the railroad. And then we're going to talk uh, about the Nevada interurban. And uh, this was the only interurban ever built in Nevada. Um, it was built in 1907 by L.W. Barham, and he was a former sheep rancher. Uh, the Nevada interurban, however, was probably more of a glorified streetcar than an actual interurban. Um, when you look at the, the image of this car, um, it actually looks probably more like a, maybe like an oversized street car as opposed to an actual interurban, like we looked at uh, the example from the Pacific Electric Railroad. Here's the route for the Nevada interurban. Um, so the Nevada interurban begins at California Street and Plumas. And so from there, they would uh, head south to the Moana Hot Springs. Um, north, of, so, and then as we talked about a little bit earlier, um, there was a streetcar extension um, that the Reno Traction Company built from, from California and Plumas that went up to Virginia Street and connected to the SP Depot downtown. The Nevada Interurban would use those tracks to, to gain entry in the downtown Reno. Uh, they had an agreement with the Reno Traction Company to do that. Um, and so at that point, so they did have a connection to downtown Reno, the line's primary purpose, Moana Hot Springs. And um, so this was the, the lines, this was the main purpose of the Nevada, the Nevada interurban at that time. And these, lo these baths were located west of Virginia Street on Moana. The Nevada interurban took in $14,000 in 1908 but revenue fell to $5,000 per year by 1917. In 1918, the line ended operations during the winter months due to the lack of business as people just weren't going to the baths 
uh, during the winter months. With Reno Traction's abandonment of the lines south of the SP Depot in 1920, that meant that the Nevada Interurban no longer had a connection into downtown Reno. And so once they no longer had that connection in downtown Reno, uh, traffic declined even further. And so the last run uh, to Mo Moana Hot Springs was in October of 1920. And then the Nevada Interurban shut down after that. Point. This is the last um, uh, historic transit company we'll talk about. And this is uh, BT Transit. Um, the Virginia and Truckee Railway was facing increased competition from buses and uh, automobiles, especially after the opening of a, a concrete highway between Reno and Carson City in 1922. And so some of the employees from the from the VNT, uh, Frank Murphy and Samuel Bigelow, uh, they started the Reno Virginia Transportation Company on May 26, 1925. Murphy became the president of the company and Bigelow was the, the secretary and traffic manager. And um, service began in 1925 between Virginia City and Reno. And here's an example of a Virginia Truckee Transit Company bus. On January 3rd, 1928, the, the name changed to Virginia Truckee Transit Company. And uh, it became a wholly owned subsidiary of the VNT Railway. So, um, the the VNT railroad actually uh, purchased a stake in this uh, company, and and so here's one of the photos of the Virginia Truckee Transit Company buses in Virginia City. Later on, uh, in 1929, uh, the VT Transit Company formed a relationship with the Crumley Transportation Company. And so this is an example of a Crumley Transportation Company bus in Tonopah. Um, they, uh, they had a partnership with Crumley Transportation Company so that they could transport VT Transit riders uh, down to Tonopah and back. Um, this partnership lasted about one year from May 1929 to May 1930. It was a very short-lived ex uh, experiment. Here we have an example of a a Virginia Truckee Railway and Virginia Truckee Transit Company uh, operating schedule from 1931. And um, so the VT Transit operated buses from Reno to Virginia, Virginia City via both Carson City and also uh, over the Geiger grade. Also, it operated bus service to Carson City, Yarrington, and then down to Hawthorne. And also, you can see here, uh, they operated um, a bus from Reno to Camp Richardson at Lake Tahoe uh, during the summer months as well. And that, that route uh, operated over Schooner Summit. And then these services, uh, these services were good for the Virginia Truckee Railway. Because it allowed them to uh, offer uh, passenger services um, throughout up to Lake Tahoe and to the rest of and other parts of Nevada, down to Hawthorne. Um, and it allowed them to do that without having to build more railroad lines. It was a cheaper way for them to uh, extend their footprint throughout uh, Nevada and um, parts of California. And this is a photo from Carson City at the V&T Depot um, here in Carson City from the around the 1940s. And so you can see we have an example of um, V&T buses at that time that are loading and unloading passengers. Uh, you can see the train in the background um, that's probably just arrived and uh, they're transferring, they're probably transferring uh, between the two modes of transportation. Um, the, the VT transit services were similar to the train services. They, they handled passengers, parcels, and mail. Also on September 22nd, 1929, um, the VNT, the VT transit lines provided an opportunity to shift VNT daily trains number numbers one and two to the Reno Minden route instead of the route instead of the Reno to Virginia City route, which had declining traffic. So VNT trains uh, one and two originally operated from Reno to Virginia City, but then once uh, uh, the buses came along, they were able to shift that train to the Reno Minden route. And then they could serve, um, they could still serve Virginia City with the buses if um, passengers wanted to go there. Because um, that, that service was definitely in decline during that time period. Sam Bigelow purchased secondhand buses 
to replace worn out V and T vehicles in 1939 and 1940. And so I believe that this bus that says Yarrington on it, um, I believe that's one of the buses they purchased at that time. The business for the V&T Transit was um, not very profitable at all. And the V&T Transit followed the V&T Railroad in the receivership from 1938 to 1946. So now we have, we have a color photo here of a Virginia Truckee Transit Company bus from the 1940s. Um, obviously, it's uh, in Minden, the Minden Butter Manufacturing Company. Uh, I believe that building still exists today. Um, so in, um, so let's see, uh, VNT Vice President and General Manager Gordon Sampson was concerned about competition from uh, privately owned automobiles and from uh, bus companies such as Greyhound. Um, on December 31st, 1947, the VNT Railway and VT Transit uh, were sold to the Vernon, was sold to Vernon Durkee and James Wood of Reno for $25,000. Um, Durkee was the former agent for Greyhound in Reno. And, um, and so he had experience in bus operations at that time. Um, Durkee and Wood continued to operate VT Transit into the 1970s. Um, VT Transit then became part of Peerless Stage Company in the 1970s. And then that company no longer exists. The VT Transit, um, while it had some modest success, ultimately it proved unsuccessful from a financial standpoint for the VNT Railway. Um, and I, I, when I, I talked with um, Stephen Drew, uh, form, he's the former California State Railroad Museum curator, um, and he's a well-known historian on the VNT Railway. Um, he's he's kind of like the ultimate authority these days. Um, he's, he uh, mentioned that back in the 80s, he acquired for the California State Railroad Museum, the papers for the Peerless Stage Company. Um, so if you wanted to look at any of the, the papers for the VNT Transit Company, they were, they're were they located in Sacramento uh, with the Peerless Stage Company uh, bus routes or the, the archives. Uh, we'll finish up with a very brief um, look at Northern Nevada Transit today. Um, so this is uh, a photo of uh, RTC, uh, the Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, in 1978, Regional Transportation Com the Regional Transportation Commission took over bus operations from Reno Bus Company, uh, which was a private corporation at that time. Reno Bus Company served the area from 1941 to 1978. Um, the new transit operations were called RTC Ride. And the transit service started with five used buses and operated on four different routes. Um, today, RTC Ride serves 8.4 million riders annually on 26 routes using 70 different buses. Um, the service area includes Reno and Sparks with Reno inner city serving as a commuter route uh, down to Carson City. And here's a modern example of one of the RTC buses um, that they use today. And then of course, here in Carson City, we have uh, Jump Around Carson. Um, Jump Around Carson started in 2005 and it serves, um, it serves Carson City using three different routes. Um, also it connects with service from RTC Inner City and the Tahoe Transportation District. And finally, we have uh, the Tahoe Transportation District. And the Tahoe Transportation District is a joint agency between California and Nevada governments to provide transportation and transit services at Lake Tahoe. And uh, these bus routes connect uh, South Lake Tahoe with Gardnerville and Carson City. And also there's um, bus routes that serve um, Sand Harbor and Incline Village and uh, the North Shore of, of Lake Tahoe as well. That concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them at this time. Adam, we do have a few questions. Uh, first, I want to say thank you so much for spending your time with us this afternoon. That was fabulous, and I learned a lot. Um, thank you.
So thank you. And I know everyone is, is, is clapping silently here for you. Um, one of the first questions I have uh, was early on in your presentation uh, and uh, to avoid interrupting, I just wanted to save them till the end. So one of the first questions is, are there is any Nevada transit cars preserved at museums here? Um, there are none that are preserved. Um, I've heard of rumors that there's one that still exists somewhere at Sparks, but I don't know where that would be. Um, but I have, I have heard that, that there may have been some cars that existed into the 70s and 80s, but um, just the like, body, like a, a body of a car, but I don't know if um, if those still exist today. Okay. But if they do, let us know, <laughs> or or let Christine know, so <laughs> if she wants it for the collection there too. <laughs> and another question here: Why did the VNT need an electric train from Reno to Carson when they already had train service? That's a good question. So. Um, at this time, so when they were, when Phoenix was, George Phoenix was trying to, um, uh, he, because he wanted to build this inner urban that would go to Seaboat Hot Springs. And then later he decided that he wanted to continue that route all the way up to Jumbo, where there was mining districts up there. And um, so the VNT, basically they, they were, they, this was basically a threat from the VNT. They, they were basically saying, if you want to compete with us on this stretch, because the, the VNT operated past um, Seaboat Hot Springs and then into Washoe Valley towards uh, the Jumbo Mining District, uh, the VNT considered this their territory. And so they were basically just giving George Phoenix a run for his money. Like, if, well, if you're going to do that, then we're gonna to propose to electrify our lines and you're just gonna be out of business anyway if we decide to go that route. And so once they uh, once they did that, then George Phoenix had no option but to just kind of give up. That, okay, great, thank you. Um, another question here, is there a bus service from Reno to Lake Tahoe? From Reno to Lake Tahoe, um, I don't think that there is because um, I've been uh, kind of interested in it. If they're actually, if they actually had it, but you can, like you. Can, so like during the week, like, there's kind of a like Monday through Friday. You can, if you if you really were like a, a transit nerd, <laughs> like I tend to be when I travel elsewhere, um, you could probably you could take a bus from Reno to Carson City on that Reno inner city commuter line. And then you could connect to the Tahoe transportation district and they would take you from Carson city up to Lake Tahoe. Um, because that would be one option. Um, and I believe you could also take the California Zephyr, the Amtrak California Zephyr from Reno to Truckee and then get on a bus at Truckee that would take you uh, around the lake as well. So there are options if you really want to geek out and find them. They're not terribly well known or convenient, but you can. Well, I think a lot of people here might want to, given that, oh, yeah. that this is why they're tuned in. We have, exactly. a couple, <laughs> we have a couple other questions. I don't want to keep you too long. If you don't oh. mind, a couple more. And um, I'll save, Scott Carey has a question for you. I'll save that till the end because it's perfect. Um, so is there a bus service from Reno to Tahoe we got? And then given the, that many of the transit and traction railway, railways were electric uh, power, do you know where the electricity was generated? Was it steam turbine generated in plants or water turbine generated from the Truckee River Canyon and Newlands project? That's a good question. And I, I think at that time, they, it would have been from the Newlands project. I, there were, I believe at that time, there would have been enough energy um, I think Reno was still small enough that um, you could you they would use that electricity from uh, the I believe it's the Fleischhacker uh, GE plants that were on the Truckee River and I, I think that's how they would generate that um, okay. that power because even at that time too they were generating power um, on the Truckee River to be used at Virginia City um, in the the mills there back in the like 1890s or so. Um, so I think there might have been enough power from those power plants that they could have used that um, 
on the electric electrified railroad systems, uh, transit systems. Okay, great. And then just two two questions. Two right. more. Uh, how long did the inner urban in Reno run? Um, so it operated um, until 1920. I think it started 1907 to 1920. Um, and, and that was more like, like I kind of mentioned, it, was, it, it seemed more like a glorified streetcar. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it was, uh, uh, I think, it, it, I mean, when you look at the picture of it, it, it kind of looks a little bit bigger than a streetcar, but it's not quite big enough to be an inner urban that we would typically think of. Um, but, um, but yeah, still it, it's, um, uh, it, it operated. Yeah. So it, it operated for about 13 years. Great. And then one last question, and then I'll get to Mr. Carey okay. uh, is Adam, can you talk a little bit about the railroad between Carson city and Virginia city? That seems like a whole presentation all by itself. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could do a whole presentation on the, <laughs> at some point. um, but the, the, the line, uh, from, uh, Carson City up to Virginia City. That was completed in 1869 by the Virginia, excuse me, uh, yeah, 1869, 1870. It was completed in 1870 by the uh, Virginia and Truckee Railroad. And um, so they, they built the line from, yeah, from Virginia City down to Carson City. The line ended near the Mint um, at that time uh, in Carson City because they, they were using the, um, the line to haul or they're, they're basically carrying the ore from Virginia City and the Comstock down to the mills on the Carson River to get processed. And then um, the, so that was the traffic coming down from the Comstock and the traffic going up to the Comstock was generally uh, wood, lumber uh, and supplies that were coming from Lake Tahoe. Um, so they'd have, they would take the lumber, put it on a train at Virginia City and carry it up to uh, Virginia City, and they were they would use the wood to uh, for the square set timbering that they used in the mines, and they would also use that wood as fuel uh, at the various places in town. Um, the Virginia Truckee was one of the richest railroads in the world at that time. They were just making money hand over fist. They were operating like twenty six trains a day on this uh, this railroad that uh, was probably not designed for that much traffic, um, but they were able to make it work anyway. Um, it was, I believe the average grade on that railroad from Carson City to Reno is about 2.2%, which for railroads is pretty steep because we, when you're operating a steam train or operating a, a train, it's uh, you basically have steel on steel, the steel wheels on the steel rails. So it's harder to maintain traction. And, um, and then the, I believe the amount of curvature in the, the tracks that head from Carson City up to Reno would make a complete, I think it would complete 17 circles. <laughs> so it would be the, the, the degrees of the curvature. So 360 times 17, that's, that's how many uh, circles it would take to get up to uh, Virginia City using the, the BT tracks at that time. So it's, it's fair to say that movement throughout our general geography in this part of the, the country was extensive and purposeful and laborious. Yes, yeah, and it was very tough. Yeah, and even before then too, I mean, they were, I mean, they were using oxen and carts and, you know, take, taking that up the Geiger grade. Um, and even the, the first locomotive that was used on the BAT was, uh, was the lion, which we have a replica of the lion here at the VT or at the at the Nevada State Railroad Museum that we're working on now. Uh, we just acquired that about a year ago. But anyway, that was a, a locomotive that was built in San Francisco, and it's it's small by you know, but at that from you know by modern standards it's small. But they actually had to disassemble this locomotive um, and in parts and carry it up Geiger grade. To, to Virginia City because there was no railroad between Reno and Virginia City in 1869 when this locomotive arrived. Uh, so it, it, I just can't imagine what it would be like to carry a giant locomotive boiler up Geiger grade with a team of oxen and that tender and all the like the cab and that you had to disassemble all this, all the wheels. I mean, that's a, 
that locomotive is probably like 15, 20 tons. And you had to disassemble all that and take it up to Virginia City on an ox cart or several ox carts. Um, they did quite a, like when you just think about back at that time, the, the amount of um, work and like it was just really labor intensive, a lot of this work. Um, just to like just the mining, like I, I can't imagine doing any of that type of work so much. Today. I was just helping with um, putting in track here at the railroad museum uh, a few weeks ago, and after 15 minutes, my back hurt. And, like, <laughs> I can't imagine doing this for eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, for six days a week, <laughs> like they might have done back then. I hope that answered the question. I mean, it just it been did. Off. It did. And so we'll start. We'll finish uh, with Scott's uh, statement here, and then I'll I'll wrap it up after that. But he says, "Great presentation." And what's going on at the State Railroad Museum? Are there any cool events coming up? And how much does it cost to ride the train? Oh, thank you, Scott. Um, yeah. So right now um, we have some interesting things going on at the Railroad Museum. Well, actually, this weekend. We have our McKean motor car out and our Edwards motor car out for, um, this is like our, basically the first weekend of operations for the year. And so, yeah, it's been pretty busy today. Um, we had motor cars operating from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I think they may have done an extra run because um, I kept hearing the whistles. I don't know if you guys heard the whistles at all, um, but I kept hearing them throughout my presentation. But anyway, so we'll be having the motor cars out again tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for Mother's Day. So if you wanted to come out and experience the McKean motor car, it's uh, there are 152 of these cars built and we have the only one in the world that's fully restored and operable. And it operated on the Virginian Truckee from Reno to Carson City and down to Minden. So it's a really unique experience to um, take advantage of riding a, a piece of Nevada, historic Nevada railroad equipment. Um, so we have that going on tomorrow. Um, more, Memorial Day weekend, we'll have uh, our steam train rides with locomotive, ET locomotive number 25. It'll be hauling uh, uh, historic B&T railroad equipment so you can ride in that as well. We have our rail camp coming up in June, which is a, a really unique experience where um, we have uh, visitors that come in from all over the country. Actually, a lot of our visitors are coming in from, from either the area or the West Coast. We've had a lot of interest in it this year, and we limit it to about six or eight uh, participants. But you get to spend four days at the museum, uh, kind of like in a railroad fantasy camp, <laughs> where you get to learn how, learn about uh, railroad safety, uh, railroad operations. You get to operate our motor cars. Uh, you get to learn how to to fire and operate the steam locomotive number 25. You get to learn how we build trains and uh, how we couple those together, throw switches. Um, and we have a special surprise on the Sunday, the last day of the event. Um, meals are included um, for breakfast and lunch. We have a banquet on Saturday night for the, the participants. Um, we've been doing this for a, a few years now and it's been, it's this year, I think we didn't, we, we had to cancel it last year, but this year we sold out in March and um, which was really unusual for us. We usually, we don't sell out till maybe a week before the event starts. And so we've just been getting so many, uh, we, we just been overwhelmed by the response to our rail camp this year. So uh, it's just been, um, really great to see so many people. I guess everybody just wants to get out and do something. And so- um, well, it Sounds like a great event too. Yeah, so it's a lot of fun. So yeah, uh, those are some of the things that we have going on right now uh, at the museum. Well, that's fabulous. I'm glad you were able to plug some of those events. And um, actually I'll have you circle back to that. Um, let me do my own plug here. Uh, as I thank you for joining us. Um, so the Sparks Heritage Museum, uh, we consider ourselves great fans of yours. And we know we've had a long uh, partnership over many decades. Yeah. And so we're glad to be friends of your museum and, and you know that you are friends of ours as well. So thank you again thank for your you. participation today. Um, for everybody here that's still here with us, um, our museum is open Tuesday through Friday, 11 to four, and we intend to resume our train tours beginning on Saturday, June 5th. We're excited about that. Of course, uh, COVID 
measures applied with masks and everything at this time. Um, if you haven't been by our museum in a, world, uh, in a while, please come by and see some of the new exhibits that we have on. We still have our uh, history of the sister cities that was curated by Stephanie Fry and the history on the Nevada State Board on Geographic Names that was guest curated by Jack Hirsch. Um, these are both on and through June 19th and admission is $5 and members start uh, members are free to everything and start at just $30 for memberships, which gets you into all of our programs for the rest of the year for free. So consider joining as a member. And for the rest of you uh, that, that are already members, we are so glad to have your continued support here with the Sparks Heritage Museum. And any other information that you need or you want to connect with Adam, have any final questions, email us at info at sparksmuseum.org. And you, you can soon be able to access our website and see uh, this lecture again, as well as some of our past lectures that'll be posted on our website. And so with that, I will circle back and Adam, um, what are your days and hours at your museum? Uh, so the Nevada State Railroad Museum is open Thursday through Monday, uh, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And um, museum admission is $8 for adults and ages 17 and under are free. So if you have if you're an adult with like 20 kids, come to the museum and you only have to pay $8. It's a great value for visitors. Um, and then our, our train rides. Um, so the McKean car that we're operating tomorrow, that's $8 for adults uh, or ages 12 and over, half price of $4 for ages four to 11 and free for ages three and under. And that's also the same price for our steam train rides as well. Um, and then we also have the Edwards card tomorrow, which is $6 for adults and $3 ages four to 11 and free for ages three and under. So yeah, and I, you, and I know you, visit. you offer memberships as well. Yes, we have, we have memberships as well. Um, we were busy today selling memberships, which, um, I was grateful for, um, I think we had three today. So we were really excited about that. Um, yeah, we have museum memberships. So, and that gets you. Um, free admission to the Nevada State Railroad Museum, but it also gets you free admission to all the Nevada State Museums, uh, like the, the State Museum in Carson City, the Nevada Historical Society, uh, our museum out in Ely, uh, down in Las Vegas and Boulder City as well, Lost City. So um, it's a great value and um, definitely you should check it out. And on June 5th, when we resume, hopefully resume the, the tours, and you'll be watching for those, those announcements on our website and our, our e-blasts and things like that. Um, we, we will invite people back and you'll get to go through the train with our uh, wonderful conductor, Mr. Dick Dryling, who has performed these tours for many years. And he's just a wonderful resource of, for information and provides a really thorough and entertaining tour as well. So thanks for for chiming in there. And with that, I think we are done. And Adam, I can release you. And thank you so much for joining us here today.